So this is the PDF for the Chapter 12 homework. Apologize for the fact that the pencast didn't work. It did not work. I don't know why it kept crashing. So this is my workaround. Um, I'm going to go through these problems, talk about them a little bit. So for problem 13 for part A, you're trying to find the center of mass, the x direction, and the y direction. So I'm adding mass times position plus mass times position plus mass times position all in the x directions divided by the total mass. That gets me 5.71 centimeters in the x direction. And I do the same thing in the y direction. It gets me 4.57 centimeters to find my center of mass. For part B, I initially was doing this wrong. That's this top part that was scratched out. And trying to think, well, if I could find the position of the center of mass from where it's rotating, then I could just simply use that times mr squared. Well, it doesn't work that way. Because each of the pieces at the corner of this are multiply their, their uh, moment of inertia is mr squared. Well, since it's r squared and not r, you see it simply can't take an average distance. So I had to add up all the pieces, the mr squareds of all the spheres. So 0 0.2 times 0.128 meters squared plus 0.2 times 0.1 meters squared plus 0.2 times 0.08 meters squared. This is the distance along the hypotenuse to the mass at the far end. And I got 0 0.06656 kilogram meters squared. Problem 24, there's a couple ways you could do this to figure out uh, the angular velocity. One would be to recognize that the area of this, in other words, the integral of that area from 0 to 2 seconds, uh, would tell me the amount of... Um, actually, I think that if that's force versus time, that'd be impulse. So it's angular impulse, I guess. That's kind of interesting. Um, but anyhow, if I take that and divide it by the moment of inertia, uh, which was given, then I could figure that out um, in terms of the angular velocity. So just like how impulse divided by mass would give me velocity, or momentum divided by mass would give me velocity, angular impulse divided by moment of inertia would give me angular um, velocity. Kind of weird. Or I can simply figure out that angular acceleration is torque divided by moment of inertia. So I could get my acceleration is 0.25 radians per second squared on average and figure that out for 0.2 seconds multiplied through and then I get 0.5 radians per second at the end. So this is the average torque. Notice it goes from 0 to 2. So the average torque would be 1 newton meter. For problem 31, you've got two cats and a bowl of tuna fish on here. Uh, this drawing was kind of crappy, so I redrew it down here. So 5 kilogram cat at the right end, uh, pivot point here at the center. If there's another cat, we don't know how far it's going to go to the left. And then the tuna fish is 2 kilograms at the far left end. So essentially, we have to figure out where the cat's going to go in order for this thing to balance. So torque counterclockwise equals torque clockwise. 4 kilograms times x distance from the pivot point and plus 2 kilograms at 2 meters away on the left side is equal to 5 kilograms times 2 meters away on the right side. So I get that the distance is 1.5 meters to the left of the pivot point. So whenever you're calculating torques and distances with torques, it would be the distance away from the fulcrum, aka the pivot point. <coughs> so for number 32, in this particular case, uh, it was asking about just hold on for a second here. Um, a car's tire is 60 centimeters in diameter. It's about two feet. Um, the car is traveling at a speed of 20 meters per second. What's the tire's angular velocity in RPM? RPM is revolutions per minute. So first of all, I have to get radians per second. So that's the velocity divided by the radius, and not the diameter, which they gave us, but the radius. Um, that's 66.7 radians per second. So then I know there's one revolution in 2 pi radians. I know there's 60 seconds and one minute. So that will let me get 637 RPMs. Now it seems a little weird. It's, well, why am I dividing by meters? And yet it seems in the top here, here well, RPMs is revolutions per minute. So it's really like revolution slash over minute. Um, for part B, 
The average speed is 20 meters per second, the top of the tire is 40, and the bottom is zero. For number five, um, oh, I screwed this up initially. So for some reason or another, I thought it was a rod rotating about its center. It's not. It was a rod rotating about its, um, or pardon me, about its end. Instead, it was a rod rotating about its center. I'm just going to check that now to make sense. Flipping the page. Yeah. So the moment of inertia is much less, 1 12th ml squared. And L is the total length. So essentially to do that, I can get um, the moment of inertia, which is here, would actually be um, 1 quarter of this amount multiplied by the angular velocity gets me the angular momentum. So this is 2.09 kilogram meter squared radian per second. This angular velocity is determined from 120 revolutions per minute. Number 62 over here. I hope you like this problem. I thought it was kind of fun. I showed a weird picture of a guy relaxing on the uh, uh, beam supported by um, it was like a cable, I guess, going up at an angle, 30 degree angle, up onto the left. So in this case, it's a torque problem. You would use the wall as your fulcrum. So the beam has a weight down, um, 1,450 kilograms. The worker has 80 kilograms, and they're located a little further out. You do need to make sure it's in newtons because the tension of the cable is rated in newtons. So we've got to multiply everything by 9.8. Clockwise torque was <coughs> uh, 4,352 think, and that seems like that might be 43,520 newton meters, and then 3136 for um, just the person himself. Yep, so that ends up being a total of around 46,000, 47,000, and it's 3F is the torque clockwise. Why is that? Well, this particular um, torque pulling this up is going to be this force times the distance, which is 6 meters, times the sine of 30 degrees. The sine of 30 degrees is 0.5, so 0.5 times 6 times F is equal to 3F. So 3F equals around 46,000 newtons, newton meters, and so then the force is 15,555 newtons. That's a problem because that tension was greater than the rating of 15,000 newtons. So the person should worry. 69 is very, very similar um, to the example I did in class using um, acceler finding acceleration from the equivalent mass of the system. So told you the radius of the pulley, told you the mass of the pulley, so it was a solid disk. Um, find the time for the four kilogram object to fall one meter. It is not free fall. So I'm thinking A equals F over M equivalent. So hopefully you can see here, got four kilograms on the one side, two on the other side. So the net force is going to be 19.6 newtons. The mass is four kilograms for the one block, two kilograms for the other block, and one half times two kilograms or one kilogram for the pulley. So the idea is that the pulley is a solid cylinder, so its moment of inertia is 0.5 mR square. So if you have a torque caused by a rope on the outside edge, that means that the pulley only acts as if it has one half the mass. So it would if it was a hoop where all the mass is on the outside edge. So the problem now is I've got to also subtract off the force of friction. How do I do that? Well, it said that there was 0 0.06 meters was the radius, and there was 0 0.50 newton meters of torque caused by friction. Well, if I know that radius and I know the torque, I can find the force of friction. Its equivalent is 8.33 newtons. So overall, acceleration is 39.2 newtons, which is the weight of the 4 kilogram mass, minus 19.6 newtons, which is the weight of the 2 kilogram mass, minus the force caused by friction, although that was determined from a torque, and ended up being 8.33 newtons, all over a fairly large total mass of 4 plus 1 plus 1, or 4 plus 2 plus 1 kilogram. This is the equivalent mass of the pulley. That's one kilogram, because although it's a two kilogram pulley, it's a solid disc, 
That means its mass is essentially halfway out from the center. So we think of it as having half of the mass. So in this particular case, 11.27 newtons over 7 kilograms gives me an acceleration of 1.6 meters per second squared. Now I can plug that into x equals 1 half at squared and get my time. There is an alternate method to show a little bit down here. All right, for number 74, this was fairly mathy, I think. Uh, yeah, well, I guess all these are kind of mathy. Um, in this particular case, you've got something that's rotating on its outside edge and it's falling. So in other words, it's like a there's like a spear going through the outside edge of the solid disk, and initially it's um, basically pointing out to the side, and it says it falls, and you want to find the final um, foot angular velocity. So overall, to find the acceleration, the initial angular acceleration, which is right here, I get torque divided by moment of inertia. So the torque would be basically mg times the distance. So it was 5 kilograms, 5 kilograms, times 9.8 newtons per kilogram, times 0.3 meters is 14.7 newton meters. To find the overall moment of inertia, I'd find 0.5 mr squared, which is due to being a, sil a solid cylinder, and the parallel axis theorem basically says, well, how much extra inertia do we have because this thing isn't rotating about the center? Well, that's simply mass times the distance the mass is away from the center of mass. So that ended up being, um, a total in this case, of 5 kilograms, but that distance is the full radius away, which is 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters. So doing the maths for those, 5 times 0.3 squared, 0.3 squared is 0 0.09 times 5, 0.45. So overall you combine all these things together, you get 14.7 uh, newton meters divided by 0.675 kilogram meters squared, and that's around 22 radians per second squared. So kind of a lot for the angular acceleration there. The last part, you need to think energy. Now this was tricky, tricky. EI does equal EF. And you think, well, the gravitational potential energy is going to turn into kinetic energy and maybe some kinetic rotational energy. Actually, this turns into all kinetic rotational energy. So the idea is this thing is falling down, the center of mass is getting lower, but it's not the Earth, or uh, pardon me, the center of mass is getting lower on this, but it's not gaining kinetic energy in the fact that it's moving linearly a certain distance. It's all about rotating about that point. So Essentially, I can think of all this uh, mechanical energy as rotational kinetic energy, at least at the bottom of that path. Or well, somewhere else, I think you might have to add this in somehow. So U grav equals Ke rotational. MGH equals 1 half I omega squared. Comes out to 6.6 .6 radians per second. Um, I don't like, like doing this this way necessarily, but I do hope that it was at least more useful to you than not having anything done at all. Peace out. That's chapter 12.